When I was around 14, my family home got broken into. My mother was never able to get over the terror and disgust she felt over strangers violating our personal space. So we moved to a new home, a few blocks away. Our new home was big and safe and had a security system. The only feature of this security system that we ever used was the electronic door lock, which came equipped with a passcode. My parents are of an age where it is more important for a password to be memorable than to be secret and secure. So they set the code to be the last four digits of our home phone number. Now this was back in 2004, so phone books were more commonplace, and literally anyone who had access to phone listings could have matched up our phone number to our address. The first eight years or so of living in that house were fine. We never gave our passcode out to anyone. But now that the danger was out of our minds, we also never thought to change it. In 2012, my family bought a cabin and subsequently spent many summer weekends, weeks, and sometimes months up there, with my dad coming back into the city for work. Being a 22-year-old woman with a healthy social life, I rarely joined them on the cabin trips away, instead opting to throw small parties with close friends. And I should note here that none of the parties I ever held resulted in strangers arriving in my home. They were all close friends who I trusted not to make a mess of the place while my family was away. Every time my family was away and I was alone in the house, I felt extremely tense and very freaked out. I often coerced friends and boyfriends into staying over, but even the days spent alone would get to me. The problem was the noises I would hear, often sounding like someone was still home, walking around upstairs and the running water in the sink. Sometimes I would open a door and later find it was closed. My cat was constantly on edge, which I chalked up to my whole family being gone, and the silence making her nervous. One specific incident occurred one night in 2013. I had actually moved out by this point, but I often returned to pet set while my family was away. Both of our family dogs were home, and my cat had been sick a few times that evening, so I decided the best course of action would be to stay overnight and keep an eye on her. I went downstairs to my former bedroom, and after an hour or so of playing on my phone and tossing and turning, I fell asleep. I had not been asleep for long, but I was jolted awake by the sounds of my dogs barking from upstairs. They are easy barkers, and my first instinct was to feel frustrated with them for interrupting my sleep. Suddenly, I heard what sounded like footprints thudding up the basement stairs, and I paused. I didn't hear another sound, so I left my bedroom to investigate. I got to the top of the stairs and noticed that the front door was wide open and there were small bits of dirt and mud on the floor as though someone had walked in with dirty shoes. After this, I absolutely refused to stay at my parents' place overnight. My friends and family chalked it up to being a prank and my brothers both claimed ignorance. My mother in particular went so far as to tell me that it was probably just my overactive imagination and that I had not closed the door properly or something. Things quietened down as I spent less and less time alone at my parents' place. In fact, everything was fine until the spring of 2015. My family went out of town for a weekend and took all the pets with them. I was still in the city Friday night, but left on Saturday to head out on a small road trip. On Sunday, I received a frantic message from my mom asking me if I'd stop by the house at all before I left. I said no. And then she told me that when they arrived home, every single light in the house was on. She said the living room appeared lived in, with a dirty dish and half-empty water glass on the coffee table. She said that the basement door was wide open, as was the door to my old bedroom, and that the bed appeared messy and unmade. It is worth noting here that my mother is a bit of a clean freak and would never leave a dirty dish out before leaving for the weekend or neglect to turn the lights off. She would also never let a bed go unmade for more than a few hours. In fact, this incident terrified her so much that she finally took my initial advice and changed the password for the front door to something more obscure. Everything was back to normal for a while. I even watched the house while my family was gone for a few times that summer. Then, one weekend came up during which my family was at the lake and I was unable to check up on the house due to hectic work and social weekend. 
We asked a trusted neighbor to keep an eye on the place and let us know if he saw anything suspicious. A couple of days later, he approached my parents to tell us that while we were gone, there had been no suspicious activity. No suspicious activity, except that their son had pulled up to the driveway in a silver car and had repeatedly tried to get in the front door. You know, the son who always checks up on the place when you guys are gone. He then saw the boy head around the side gate and attempt to open it before heading back to his car and driving away. This would have been all well and good, except for one minor detail. I have two brothers, both of them were at the cabin, and neither of them drives a silver car. No other suspicious events have occurred since. I am still petrified to spend too much time alone at my parents' place. I was maybe around 13 to 14 years old at the time, and I was recently granted the privilege of staying home alone. Every now and then, when I was home alone, I'd hear sounds coming from upstairs, and so I would instinctively call my mom. She then told me a story of how she used to hear things in her old house all the time, and how it's just the house settling in. Fast forward to many instances of sound later. I decided that the very next time I was going to be home alone, I was going to be completely silent and make as little noise as possible. Within the first half an hour, there was nothing, not a peep out of the entire house. I eventually got bored and felt safe, so I went to grab the TV remote and watch some TV. But a few seconds before I grabbed the remote, I heard a huge crash from upstairs and running footsteps. I was sure more than ever that someone was in the house. By now, there was plenty of consistent sounds coming from upstairs, and it became a fact that someone was upstairs. Fourteen-year-old me decided to hatch a plan quick. Being the skinny, most non-threatening little girl I was, I first grabbed a kitchen knife. Then, I grabbed a shoe and propped open the front door. After a few minutes of some deep breaths, I yelled out in the deepest voice I could, I know you're upstairs. I'm giving you the chance to leave without me calling the police. I have propped the front door open and I will be in the bathroom. Be aware that I'm holding a knife and if you refuse to leave, I will call the police. Sure enough, I walk into the bathroom with my knife, absolutely scared to death that someone will open the door. I wait and I wait until the one sound that to this day will always scare me for this reason. I heard the front door close and the shoe was moved. I quickly locked the door and turned on the alarm system. I hope to never see or even hear this person again. So my boyfriend and I moved into a house about eight months ago. When we moved in, we noticed that no one lived in the house next door to us and that it was rather run down. After about a month of us living here, we come home to see a very old man, in his 80s, cleaning up the yard. We introduce ourselves, and he tells us his name is Bob. He is the owner, and is in the works fixing up the place. We've probably seen Bob about once a month since we've moved in, usually cleaning up the yard, occasionally with someone helping him. I saw Bob about three weeks ago. We chatted for a bit, and he asked if I would roll his garbage can to the curb on trash day which I did. Everything seemed normal this past week, except for the fact that the gate to Bob's backyard had been left open several times, and we hadn't actually seen Bob or any of his cats at the house. I initially thought it was kids in the neighborhood cutting through his yard, especially with school being out right now, but then one of my patio chairs in my backyard went missing. My boyfriend and I figured it was probably just some kids again, and didn't think too much of it until I came home from work one day and noticed the gate open again. I decided to walk into his backyard and look around. After turning the corner around the gate, I see my patio chair hidden behind the house. I realized there was someone clearly hanging around Bob's house. I was pretty annoyed, so I went to pick up my chair and yelled, I'm taking my shit back. As I did this, my boyfriend was at the side of the house and saw someone move behind a curtain. 
We went inside and decided to call the police because we thought someone had broken into Bob's house. I went back outside to double check the house number on the door and then saw someone crack the door open slightly, peeking out. I confronted him and asked him what he was doing there and why he stole my chair. He stepped out and said that he didn't have a stool to sit on so he just decided to borrow it and then he tried to ask us but we must not have been home. He also says his uncle owns the house and is letting him stay there. My boyfriend asks what his uncle's name was, to which he backtracked and said that Uncle John was what he called him, but still couldn't provide an actual name. We asked if he had his uncle's phone number, which he conveniently didn't. Basically, we're 99% sure at this point that this guy is a squatter as he didn't know Bob's name and didn't have his phone number. I knew Bob lived about two hours away and the police wouldn't be able to do anything without him being able to confirm or deny this guy's story. I had to go on an extensive Google search as Bob has a very common last name, but I finally found a landline listed in his name. After leaving a voicemail, Bob calls me back. He tells me that he doesn't have a nephew and that there's definitely not supposed to be anyone in the house. He calls me again a bit later to tell me that he called the police and they may be contacting me as well. Ten minutes later, the police call. I start to tell them everything that's happened, just getting to the part of him first speaking through the window. And the cop cut me off and says, Ma'am, we will be coming on foot patrol in a few minutes. Please stay inside. Then we hear the canines. We go to our window and see that the house next door is being swarmed with police. The canines are going crazy, and the officers are shouting for him to surrender. They eventually break the door down and arrest him. After the squad cars arrived and he was long gone, we went outside and spoke with the remaining officers. Turns out, the guy had been terrorizing a girl the next street over, slashed her tires, dumped gasoline on her car, and broke her window. She got a rental car and he attacked that one too. They had been chasing him for the past three days throughout the neighborhood, but he kept disappearing. They couldn't figure out where he was hiding until Bob called. Anyway, it's been an interesting Easter. In 1990-1991, my mom started working in a group home as a youth worker, doing counseling and support work. For context, this home was in a residential area, not too far from the local hospital or police station. This home had three floors and had about eight different girls who lived on the second floor and had an attic above. The main floor was where the office and kitchen area was. At the time, the agency didn't have strict regulations, so my mom would be working night shifts by herself and have to manage all these kids alone. One night, my mom began her shift and was made aware of some creepy information. Both the home supervisor and the kids who lived in the home reported weird smells at night, sounds from the attic, and food going missing on day and night shifts. Keep in mind, at the time, nobody was allowed up there or stayed there. My mom would have to do half-hour checks to ensure all the doors were locked. However, during her shifts, she didn't notice any problems. Thankfully for her, none of the weird events took place on her specific shifts. As events kept being reported, they called in maintenance workers. When the maintenance workers went around to check the property, they noticed that one of the windows on the third floor to a room which was locked had been broken. The room wasn't accessible from the inside of the house, so nobody knew. Unfortunately, that room had access to the attic. The maintenance workers went up to check the attic and found various things. Food wrappers, clothing, and even various things from the residents' bedrooms. The room that was locked off from the inside of the house was able to be opened from the other side, meaning that at some point throughout the night and day shifts, the stowaway was walking inside the home and no one knew. They would have had to have come down when the residents were either being taken to school, asleep, or at appointments, but they were also able to view the schedule in the board office. They would have known when staff were coming and going, and any days residents would have been gone. During the time that the stowaway had occupied the attic, there were reports from other staff members about them feeling as though they were being watched. 
Eventually, the maintenance workers fixed the windows. The fridge was locked, and security cameras were installed. There weren't any issues after that. I live with my mom in a house we bought a year and a half ago, but only moved in six months ago because of all the renovations that needed to be done. Often when it was in the Reno stage, I would go over there at night to hang out. And almost every time I was there, I would hear creepy creaky noises. They freaked me out, especially since the renovations included adding a whole wing to the house, which made it very easy for unwanted guests to enter. However, I know that houses make sound, so I tried to forget about it. One late night, during the Reno phase, I went over to the second house and punched in the garage code because I didn't have a key. You could hear the garage opening from pretty much anywhere in the house if you're not making too much noise. As the garage door began to open, I heard loud sounds like pots and pans being banged together. At that time, we didn't have any pans in the house. To be honest, I was terrified. Just standing there, trying to decide what I was hearing and what I should do about it. Ultimately, I decided to close the garage door and go back home. I have not heard anything like this before or since. After this, I only went to the house if I had someone with me. A couple of months later, me and my mom moved in. Fast forward to present day, the creepy house noises that I heard in the Reno phase have diminished, but I still hear them. Almost exclusively at night, roughly 3 to 4 a.m., they sound like someone accidentally knocking their elbow against the door. Nothing to be too concerned about, but I always sleep with my fan on, because I sleep in late, and the white noise blocks out any potential sounds that could scare me and make it hard for me to sleep. Last night, I wanted to conserve some energy, so I didn't turn it on. I was lying in my bed, lights off, when I heard the sound, what sounded like my basement door closing. It was 5 a.m., so definitely not my mom. I continued to hear what sounded like shuffling noises coming down the hall towards my room. My mom's bedroom is on the other side of the house, so she wouldn't hear this. I dialed 911, but didn't press call, trying to rationalize. After a few minutes of hearing nothing, I turned on my fan, but kept my phone turned on. 911 still dialed. Eventually I went to sleep. I have foster kittens that sleep in a dog crate near my mom's room. This morning, one of them was acting peculiar, very scared, hiding, hissing when I went near him. I've had him for a week, and he only exhibited this behavior in the first day, and he was fine when I put him to bed last night. His brother is a lot more laid back than him, and I haven't noticed a change in his behavior, but I'm not entirely sure I would, since he's better with strangers. Tonight, I'm going to put tape on the attic and basement doors. I sincerely hope it's still there when I wake up tomorrow. Okay, so, back when I was in the military, I was based out in California. This was pretty much right at the start of the housing bust, and I found myself newly divorced following a deployment. As such, I could no longer live on base and had to move. I quickly discovered that it now was the same price or cheaper to rent a house instead of an apartment off base. So I got in touch with a realtor who worked with residents of a local gated community. As a newly single female with zero family in the area, I thought extra security could be a good thing. I soon found the perfect house. It was amazing. It had a wraparound porch with a view of the lake in the center of the community, had trees blocking my views of my neighbors, an awesome kitchen, which I love cooking, and tons of local wildlife. I could easily see myself recovering from what had been an ungodly rough year. The owner mostly lived overseas, so I really never dealt with him except when I moved out. But he seemed very nice, if a bit particular. He obviously loved the house, so I didn't think much of that. The two times I needed something looked after, his brother came to deal with them, as he was a handyman of sorts. I always found it a bit weird that him and his brother looked like they could have been twins, to the point where I thought his brother was him when he came to pick up the dryer when it needed fixing. Literally. He picked it up 
and carried it out in his arms. The funny thing about PTSD brain, though, is that lots of normal things seem weird while strange things seem normal. So I never really thought of the landlord brother situation as odd until after. Maybe it was normal and the whole oddness of what happened is setting off my paranoia. I don't really know. But yeah, landlord odd. The brother was apparently the Hulk. Both spoke to me like I was their kid, who needed very strict instructions. Anyway, I enjoyed my time in the house. My emotional support pup loved it too. The next door neighbors had dogs for her to play with, but my PTSD and other mental issues had me on a path headed straight for medical separation. But then the president issued a series of rollback programs, and my commander highly suggested for me to take the early separation. There were a few reasons surrounding this, but the main one was the squadron knew they were the reason I was mentally messed up, and that there were more than a few people who had it in for me still at the clinic I was assigned to. Those people kept writing me up for things that no one else got written up for. Examples of this are accidentally jamming the shredder that jammed at least once a week, leaving the front desk unattended while I was having an anaphylactic attack. Having a panic attack, which left my work unattended because I was literally curled up in a ball in the corner. You get the picture. Of course, my brain took most of this stuff at face value and figured it was okay and I deserved it. But my commander was trying to protect me as best as she could and get me out of a clearly hostile work environment ASAP. So I applied and was approved for separation. Now, this meant I was leaving my lease before the year was out. I forget if my landlord just decided to be nice, or if I had to pull out a law about military members being entitled to an early release from a lease when their duty assignments changed. Probably the second one, because he wasn't happy. I didn't really have the mental capacity to care too much about putting him out though, because my scrambled brains all of a sudden had a lot of military paperwork and processing to deal with. Not to mention the fact that the whole idea that I was separating felt very surreal in the first place. I'd always thought I'd be a lifer. I didn't tell any of my neighbors I was moving. Only one of my friends knew exactly when I was moving out. And even my movers didn't know exactly when. Because I stayed on the air mattress for about a week after they picked up my things. To the best of my knowledge, no one on the base knew exactly when my house would be vacant either because I actually stayed in a motel off base for a few days after I moved out just to make the final days of last minute paperwork easier. They knew my travel plans, but I'd marked my starting location for the trip as my base, not the house. What you should be getting out of this is that only two people for sure knew the exact date I was leaving the house, my friend and my landlord. That said, even my landlord didn't know the exact date I'd be leaving the area, just when I'd vacate the premises. My landlord told me to drop the keys off in the realtor's mailbox, so that's what I did. And, after a few days, I left on my road trip home. Now about a day later, I get a call from my landlord. I'm on the road with my pup when I answer. Hey, um, you left your camera here. Are you sure? Yeah, it's a Nikon, with a nice set of lenses and a camera pack. Oh, I don't have one of those. Really? My brother said you did. I try to think back, and I remember his brother coming over to drop off the dryer while my sister and nephew were in town. She's an avid photographer, and I figure she must have had the camera bag out in preparation for our day trip to San Francisco. No, I only have one of those cannons that you fit into your pocket. He must be thinking of my sisters, but she for sure brought that home with her months ago. The landlord was silent for a while, before saying, Well, what about this sleeping bag that's here? No, I definitely have my sleeping bag. The landlord again describes my sleeping bag exactly. No, I have mine. I slept in it last night. The landlord is quiet again before answering. There's a backpack here too, with a few random items. Did you tell one of your friends they could stay here for the rest of your lease? No, only one of my friends even knows exactly when I moved out, and he's visiting his wife who's deployed in Korea right now. Well, someone's been living here. At this point, it should have occurred to me how weird it was that he'd gone from the friendly, hey, you forgot this, to the angry, you let some squatter here as fast as he did. 
but it was only just getting through my head that someone had moved in the moment I moved out. This house didn't have an attic, so this couldn't have been one of those someone was living in the attic while I was living there situations. It wasn't even a sealed off part of this house where this could be done, and I even went into the basement on a regular basis. It's possible someone was living in the woods behind the house, but I have no idea. Anyway, my landlord wanted me to come over and check the stuff to make sure it wasn't mine. I told him that I'd finished up my paperwork, so I was on the road and already in Oregon. He clearly didn't expect me to leave the area already since I still had a few days on my lease. And he told me he'd call me back after he figured things out. He never called me back. I messaged him later to follow up, but all I got was short no responses to my questions. No, they didn't know whose stuff it was. No answer when I told him I was freaked out and wanted to know what happened. Yes, he'd gotten both sets of keys from the realtor. No, he hadn't found anything else. Not long after, I got my full deposit back, which I hadn't been expecting since I felt bad for not staying my whole lease. I hadn't planned on asking for it. It wasn't until relaying this to my mom that I realized exactly how weird the whole thing was, or that my landlord might have been making up the squatter. She pointed out how strange it was that the guy who was supposedly traveling too much to use his own house would show up himself to walk through the house after I left especially since his brother did everything while I lived there. Neither of us are really sure if he was up to something, or if there really had been some extremely creepy stock or a squatter situation. Either way, the whole thing played with my already messed up head. I grew up in a village in Serbia, but after I graduated, I moved to Switzerland in search of a better life. I inherited the house I grew up in. Today, nobody is living in it, but it doesn't look abandoned. It's furnished. Me and my Swiss fiancé stay there when we're visiting Serbia, and I take good care of it whenever I visit, which is about two to three times a year. But this time, we had an unpleasant surprise when I found our entrance gate locked and movement inside the house. Eventually, the family, which were gypsies, the husband, wife, their five to six children, came to the fence to confront us. I said, what are you doing here? We own this property. And the dad replied, no, the house was empty, and the house belongs to the one who lives in it. One of the kids says, this man isn't going to kick us out, right dad? And then the dad replies, you see, my kids love it here. Also, you live abroad. You are rich. People like you should help the poor folks here. And they proceeded to hang out in the garden, ignoring us. While we were trying to talk to them, I called the police and the operator said they can't just burst in like that and that I need to report those squatters at a police station before any action could take place. Because it's Serbia, nothing functions in the Balkans. Pissed off by police and tired of the squatters ignoring me, I took a big piece of rock by the fence and I tried to break the lock. Huge mistake. A commotion started amongst the squatters. I didn't understand anything because they were yelling in their own language. And they became very aggressive. The woman started yelling profanities. How they are poor, have sick children. And at first, I thought this was a good sign. And now they want to talk. But before I could say one word, I saw the father with something metal in his hands. Yelling at me to back off from the fence. My fiancé became scared since things turned dangerous and said we should leave. So we did. With suitcases and backpacks still in our hands, we went to the police station and after some strings pulled, they agreed to kick the squatters out tomorrow. The next day, we came to our property with police presence, hoping that the squatters would just leave when they see the cops. No, now it was worse. We were greeted by two giant dogs that weren't there yesterday and a group of gypsies came to the property to support the squatters. The officers called for backup and vests. Talking to the gypsies was impossible, since they were ignoring everybody across the fence, and I was comforting my crying fiancé, who was fed up by all of this. When the vests arise, they tranquilize the dogs, which pissed off the squatters. As the police entered the property, they were attacked by gypsies. 
A brawl lasted a couple of seconds and resulted in all adult squatters getting handcuffed and arrested. As we entered the house, we saw that the interior was ruined by the squatters. They were living like animals, furniture destroyed, walls were stained, there were feces in one of the rooms, and then shock after shock. In one of the drawers, we found a lot of valuable goods, a lot of golden jewelry, cash, cell phones. The officers took all of that so they could see if it was stolen, but we all knew it was. Last but not least, an officer told me this in the end. Some of them are going to be released in a couple of days, that's for sure. And if I were you, I would be very careful. Given the amount of valuable goods, or to have revenge, they might come back. Secure your property. It's been almost a week since I slept properly. I'm afraid that they could get here any night. And I'm also anxious, because I'm soon leaving back to Switzerland. We're tired as hell. During the day, we work all day fixing the damage, and we can't sleep in the night. I just hope we don't meet them again. Hey guys, hope you're all doing well and enjoying the stories. Don't forget to leave a like and drop a comment too. If this is your first time listening to me, go ahead and subscribe and switch on notifications. Don't forget to hit me up on Twitter or my subreddit. All my links are in the description. Thanks for listening guys. I hope you're enjoying your weekend. I'll see you in the next one.